Game 82, fan appreciation night, and unfortunately, the Devils could not finish on a high note, losing to the Islanders 4-1. to one. Any positives to take away from the game? Well, there's a lot of speculation going into the offseason. We have a lot to break down in today's episode of Locked on Devils. Buckle up, everybody. You're Locked on Devils, your daily podcast on the New Jersey Devils. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi, this is Bryce Salvador, and you're Locked on Devils with Trey Matthews. Elias scores! Oh, Steven stepped up, nailed him. Rodor has got the puck. What a shot. The Devils win the Stanley Cup. All righty now. What is up, New Jersey? Welcome back to the Locked on Devils podcast here on the Locked on Network. I'm your host, college hockey club and play announcer. Dell's driver for Pucks and Pitchforks, and also part-time credential MIA member, Trey Matthews. All right. This is it. Mid-April, game 82 in the books. The New Jersey Devils obviously did not qualify for the Stanley Cup playoffs. It is officially the 2024 offseason in New Jersey. I don't know how to feel about this, but I still have a post-game recap episode to conduct. So for the final time, let's do that hockey to close out this forgettable season for the Devils. Let's be fair. In the first segment, I will share some narratives that I picked up pre-game and also post-game because the thing is, is like, we know that the Devils season was over. This was inevitable, and the announcers knew it too, and unfortunately, this was not a competitive game for the Devils. They did cut the lead in half at one point, but at the conclusion of the second period, the Islanders were up 3-1. to You just knew that the Devils weren't going to amount that comeback and they were just going through the motions and I think the announcers whether it was on the TV broadcast and also radio broadcast they kind of saw the writing on the wall that the Devils weren't going to uh, make the miraculous comeback and try to give their fans one final victory just wasn't in the cards and there was a lot of speculation between both broadcasts because this season has left a lot of questions more than answers And I'm going to address them in a short amount of time in segment one. And then in segment two, I will share some of my key takeaways from the game. And then in the third and final segment, like I do with every post-game recap, I will compare the stats and give the Devils a letter grade. All right, to begin this recap, it was fan appreciation night at The Rock. And the Devils gave their fans the biggest middle finger they could possibly give them. Because they came out flat-footed. It didn't seem like they had a a lot of energy. No momentum going their way. And it seems like they didn't learn anything from their previous matchup against the Philadelphia Flyers. In which they got shut out. And Chico Resch even brought it up at the conclusion of the first period. And I kind of agree with them. Which is the Devils sometimes had no heart. And they got to show their fans something. Because... There's no tomorrow. There's no later. There's no other opportunity. I know you're not going to the playoffs, but show your fans something. Give them something to cheer about. And speaking of which, I don't know if it's just me, but it seemed like there were a lot more Islander fans in attendance compared to Devils fans. And I guess that sort of makes sense because I guess some fans just didn't feel the need to come to the game. It wasn't worth it. Obviously, it's a Monday night. People work and Uh, If the Islanders did win this game, which they ended up doing so, they clinched a playoff spot. But that's just my two-cent opinion. And Tom Fitzgerald said pregame that he was working hard to try to extend Curtis McDermott. The thing is, is like, I love what Curtis McDermott brought to the roster, especially when it came to defending his teammates. The biggest example that I can give is the Matt Rempe situation in which he had a dirty hit on Nathan Bashin and Jonas Siegenthaler after the Siegenthaler hit, he got suspended for a few games and McDermott called him out post game for not answering the bell. And then uh, earlier this, this month, just a few weeks ago, we saw a line brawl take place the opening two seconds. And at the center of it was Rempe and McDermott. And it was entertaining to watch. And the thing I said about McDermott when the Devils first got him was to not expect much from him but he definitely adds some size and he adds physicality because how is he going to get his rest? 
Most likely he's going to fight someone and then he's going to be sitting in the penalty box for an extended period of time for a fighting major. And I'm going to talk more about this in a future episode, but you need to think of it from this perspective. Let's just say the Devils get better next year. Do you think Curtis McDermott is going to play every single game? That's my question for you. I'm open to bring back McDermott, but you got to know what his role is going to be. So for any of you who are saying like, the devil should re-sign him ASAP. Okay, that's fair. But I think some other players take priority over McDermott. And the one thing that I picked up on both broadcasts on television and radio is that there was some speculation as to who was going to be safe and who might be on the chopping block. And we saw this discussion take place on social media as well because you got some notable players like Dawson Mercer, Alexander Holtz, Jonas Siegenthaler, Kevin Ball, a few others I might be forgetting, but they might be on the chopping block come the offseason because Tom Fitzgerald sees that what he originally had just didn't work. Now you got to try to factor in some of those pieces in a potential trade package if you want to get Jacob Markstrom or another top-notch goalie. But I think another thing that we need to consider is that the defense needs to be a lot more physical because the Devils have a lot of offensive my defensemen in Shimon Nemetz, Luke Hughes, Dougie Hamilton when he comes back. It, it's great and all to have that offensive punch. And I still stand by what I said at the beginning of the year in which I stated that Dougie Hamilton is arguably one of the best offensive-minded defensemen in the entire NHL. And I think the Devils should be lucky to have him on the roster but the thing is, like, he's not going to uh, razzle and dazzle you with his defense. And that's another talking point that's been big throughout the course of the year, which is what do the Devils need? Do they need a goalie or do they need more defense? I don't think it's pick or choose. At this point, I think is what can you obtain without gutting your team? And that's where I stand in terms of the future for the Devils. And I expect for Tom Fitzgerald to get on the phone and – have those difficult discussions or contemplate like who does he need? Who doesn't he need? And I I see that Yegor Sharangovich is thriving in Calgary and that's great and all. But the thing is like, he would not be having th that type of performance if he was still with the devils because he was a pending restricted free agent. And I just didn't see any room on the roster for him because when Timo Meyer came to town, Meyer sort of took his position. And that's sort of the perspective that I want everyone to have, which is like if the Devils do move on from like Dawson Mercer or Alexander Holtz, I do anticipate for them to thrive. But the thing is, is like who is Tom Fitzgerald going to get that can help the Devils right now? And Dawson Mercer and Alexander Holtz, they could contribute somewhere else. Now, I personally love what both of them have brought to the roster, but at the end of the day, sports is a business. And that's sort of what I've been picking up on the broadcast for both radio and television. And like I said, the Devils were down three to one heading into the final period of regulation. And now it's a matter of who do the Devils resign? Who do they get rid of? Who do they try to trade for? And that's something we're going to talk about now that we are officially in the offseason because I see a lot of uh, crazy trade rumors like Brady Kachuk uh, from the Senators. I don't think that's ever going to happen or people are saying like the devil should go all in for a goalie but i answer and say be smart about it trades are an investment as i previously mentioned this season has been up and down for the devils and i'm going to talk more about this in a future episode in which i assess whether or not this season was a failure but something i want you to consider is that despite the injuries despite the coaching change despite never winning more than three games in a row and some other circumstances that just haven't gone the devil's way, they were still always knocking on the door for a playoff position. All it would have taken was for them to go on like a, another three-game winning streak or a five-game winning streak, which is something I think this team, uh, if healthy, is capable of doing. I just want to give you that sort of food for thought because when were the Devils officially mathematically eliminated from playoff contention? I'd say a week or two ago. And the fact that it took them that long to be eliminated from the playoffs, despite all the circumstances that occurred to them, I think that speaks volume about the team and their potential. 
Now, before we switch over to the next segment, I want to thank you guys because I did a lot of traveling with the Devils throughout the course of the season. Whether I was at the Prudential Center, Mullet Arena, Climate Pledge Arena, the Staples Center, uh, Honda Center, T-Mobile Arena, I traveled all across the country to bring you behind-the-scenes action for the Devils, and it doesn't happen without you guys. And I would do it again in a heartbeat. And unfortunately, I will not be present for exit interviews, but there's going to be a lot of great off-season content coming your way that I'm really excited for. Have some things in the works, and I will obviously share uh, what happens on this show. But come to think of it, I don't even think I made a profit while traveling. And if that, I don't even think I broke even. But the fact that you guys still tuned in to every episode and you enjoyed the behind-the-scenes coverage, and it, it, it was a hectic year for even me because – I went viral in late December. I was on the California road trip with the Devils. It it was a lot of fun. And the fact that I had the chance to do that, I can't thank you guys enough. And let's just keep this thing going. So Devils showing fan appreciation at their building. I want to show fan appreciation on Locked on Devils. Let's keep it moving. And just thank you guys. Can't thank you enough. You without your listenership, without your viewership, there is no show. All right, we're going to talk about this game for the Devils, in which they came out on the lose again by a score of four to one. We still have a post game recap to cover, but before we continue, let me tell you about eBay Motors passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level up to peak performance superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. All right, let's talk about this four to one loss for the Devils in which they gave their fans, whether you were in attendance or watching on your TV sets, the biggest middle finger they could possibly give because the Devils did cut the lead in half at one point, but You could just tell that they didn't really have the pep in their step. They didn't have the energy. And I think that uh, lethargic nature carried over from the previous matchup against the Flyers in which they got shut out. And speaking of the Flyers, it's just crazy that when this episode goes live, we still do not know who's going to get that second wild card spot. Who's going to be the first team eliminated in the playoffs? Is it going to be the Penguins, the Capitals, the Red Wings, or the Flyers by some miracle? It's just bedlam Look, look watching this unfold. I don't know about you guys. I like it. And we've been talking about, like, how many points is it going to take for a team to make the playoffs? And right now, it's just in the 80s. It, it's nuts. But – Going into this matchup, the Islanders had something to play for. Obviously, they clinched a playoff position. And I I, I got to give the Islanders their credit, Lou Lamorello and all those guys, because the thing is, I spoke with my colleague, Gil Martin of Locked On Islanders, when uh, he and I were collaborating on the Locked On NHL channel. And he said, similar to the Devils, it would have taken some sort of miracle for the Islanders to make the playoffs because – If you recall, just a few weeks ago, the Devils were actually ahead of them in the standings at one point, but the Islanders stuck to it, and now they're in the playoffs, and they're going to take on the Carolina Hurricanes for the second year in a row. And I'm probably going to do an episode on teams that Devils fans should and should not root for, but I think we all know the one team in which you don't want to see hoist up the Stanley Cup under any circumstance, but just for the sake of not wanting to get obliterated in the comment section. I will keep that anonymous, but we all know who it is. Wink, wink. All right. So like I just said, Devils didn't really have much to play for. And I remember doing a post-game recap episode a few days ago in which the Devils did win, 
but at what cost? And in this game against the Islanders, it's just the same mistakes that they've been making. J.G. Pajot got the party started for the Islanders, and one of the issues that we were talking about for the Devils, especially in the first half of the year, is that they give up a lot of breakaways and odd man rushes, and you saw that once again when the Islanders jumped off to a one to nothing lead. Odd man rushes, one nothing deficit. If you're curious, the Devils allowed the first goal 57 times in 82 games this season. Oh, that's another fact I want to consider. The fact that the Devils had to come back from most of their games and yet were still knocking on the door of a playoff position, that kind of speaks volume in my opinion. But according to Ryan Ovesinski of NJ.com, the Devils did not break the record, by the way. The record since 1980 is 58, set by the 2016-2017 Colorado Avalanche. Fun fact, that team also went undefeated in preseason, similar to the Devils this season. Is there some sort of script that I don't know about? Because that cannot be coincidental. Novo added on to that and said, the NHL stats site is dumb and only goes back to 1980. So the real record is actually 60, set by one of the mid-70s Capitals teams. And Bill Spaulding also brought that up a few weeks back. I can't believe uh, that that's happened for most of the year for Devils. But like I said, they they just shoot themselves in the foot by uh, jumping off to a one to nothing deficit. And then Kyle Palmieri, this is something that kind of boils my blood. All right. So Chris Tierney goes to the penalty box for tripping, which was a controversial call because I don't think he uh, deserved to go to the penalty box in that sort of circumstance. And I think Sam Kassan brought it up on the radio broadcast that he tripped some sort of phantom. And as a result, uh, he had to go to the penalty box for tripping up a ghost because whatever the ref saw, it was enough for them to assess a penalty on Tierney and Kyle Palmieri gets a power play goal. But here's something that just really pisses me off. You saw Kyle Palmieri just hang in front of Jake Allen for an extended period of time. Now, Chico Resch brought up on air and said that Scott Stevens and Cam Danico, obviously the game has changed and you essentially can't touch anyone without going to the penalty box, case in point with Chris Tierney. But back in those days, Dano and Stevens would just knock your head clean off if you're chilling on the blue crease. And yet, no Devils player saw that. Cal Palmieri, seriously, was just camping out there, and he got the tip-in goal. That is frustrating, and it goes back to what I said in segment one, which is you need to tighten up the defense as well. And if you think goaltending is a problem, that's fair and all, but defense can also be considered a problem. It's a two-way street here. And the fact that the former Devil, Kyle Palmieri, Makes it two to nothing. Islanders, you just knew the Devils were shooting themselves in the foot and they were in a, in a snafu that they could not climb out of. But they did cut the lead in half in the second period, thanks to Timo Meyer scoring. And here's something I want to uh, hammer on home for the final time this season. Ever since February 22nd, that was the day in which I released the episode telling you guys to lay off on Timo Meyer because he was struggling. Ever since I published that episode, he racked up 30 points in 27 games, 18 goals, 12 assists. I still think Timo Meyer was worth it for the Devils. Jesper Bratt continues to rack up the points. He got his 56 assists because he got the primary on Timo Meyer's goal. And I said it in my previous post-game recap episode, Jesper Bratt is now a point-per-game player. Nico Heischer, he got the secondary assist, which put Heischer up to 67 points in 71 games played. And keep in mind, Heischer missed almost a month due to injury. I'm going to keep talking about that until the cows go home. I think that's pretty damn impressive what Timo Meyer, Jesper Bratt, and Nico Heischer have been able to do because all of them have been phenomenal in their own ways. Because with Timo Meyer, you get a tail of two halves. First half, injury plague, wasn't utilized correctly, was in a bit of a funk, and didn't seem to uh, show any signs of improvement. He was wildly inconsistent, and he was sometimes an over-glorified bottom six player because 
playing on the third line, I don't think he deserved to play down there. But come the coaching change in which he acknowledged that there was better communication between him and Travis Green, you just saw a shift in Myers' game. Nico Heischer, the silent but deadly impactful player. Because Nico Heischer, in my opinion, he had a pretty good year considering the circumstances of, of missing almost an entire month of action. And yet he was close to being a point per game player. And then Jesper Brad, the breakout season that I've been predicting for the last year or so, in which I said Jesper Brad can definitely become an all star for the Devils. Albeit he did have to have some luck go his way because he was a replacement for Jack Hughes. But I don't care. He still became an all star. And this is where we all go downhill from here because the Devils, they allowed two more goals. And that's just the quintessential of their season, which is they start the game down one to nothing. And then they seem to amount some sort of comeback. They cut the lead in half. It seems like the momentum is going their way. The vibes are all good. And then it snowballs into something bigger and boom, they lose the game. Yeah, they got to control the rebound on Brock Nelson's go. And then Kyle McClain just point blank shot right in front of Jake Allen. And that's all she wrote. And fun fact, that is the first time that the Islanders beat the Devils this season because the Devils uh, won the previous three matchups. And one of the things that the Devils did really well against the Islanders is uh, take advantage of the Islanders' poor PK. The Devils have scored multiple goals on the man advantage against the Islanders. And I think back to the first game in which they played against the Islanders, I believe they had four power play goals that game. So it was just a tale of a different type of atmosphere for the Devils. And, oh, by the way, coming into this matchup, the Islanders were 0 for 12 on their previous power play attempts. And Kyle Palmieri breaks that streak, scoring on the man advantage. Irony is a funny thing. But that's how the season ends for the Devils. Nothing too exciting and something that I think everyone is used to. All right. We're going to shift over to the third segment and compare the stats to give the Devils a letter grade. But before we continue... Let me tell you guys about Sleeper. Devils finished pretty bad in the standings, but I want to remind you that you can win big by playing Daily Fancy Hockey on Sleeper, the official Daily Fancy app of Locked On NHL. Sleeper is our number one choice for Daily Fancy sports, especially Daily Fancy Hockey, because with Sleeper, you can win 100 times your cash in Daily Fancy Hockey contests. And you don't just have to participate in Fancy Hockey. You can participate in Fancy Football, Basketball, Baseball, College Football, all on Sleeper. Use the promo code Locked On NHL and you'll get a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. That's code Locked On NHL. See sleepers, terms of use for details and locational availability. All right. For the final time this season, let's compare the stats, give the Devils a letter grade, and head into the offseason. Shots on goal differential 24 to 19 in favor of the Devils. Faceoff percentage. 52% to the Devils, 48% to the Islanders. Power play. Devils were 0 for 3. Islanders were 1 for 1. Hits, 18 to 11 in favor of the Islanders. Block shots, 21 to 10 in favor of the Islanders. Giveaways, 4 to 2 in favor of the Devils. Takeaways, 8 to 6 in favor of the New York Islanders. All right. If I had to give the Devils a letter grade, well... Varlamov made 23 saves for the for the Islanders, and he is now 7-0-1 in his past eight games. So he was riding a hot streak heading into the matchup. Devils weren't really playing for anything. Islanders were competing for a playoff position. Devils are shorthanded. No, no expectations. If I had to get a uh, final game of the year, you know what? I'll be nice. I'll give them a C minus. That. I'll, I'll just end the season there. C minus for the Devils. And that's how we end the 2023-2024 season. It's in the books. Let's head into the offseason and we'll do some silly season discussions. We'll have some guests on throughout the course of the summer. Hopefully I get to cover some Devils events, including development camp. And maybe I'll travel to the draft because the Devils first round draft pick could help in trade capital and we're definitely going to uh, have a lot of discussions throughout the summer. Not how I envisioned a few weeks early than I thought, but we're still here nonetheless. Thank you for following me all season. And now let's go to Cancun. Cancun on three. 
One, two, three, Cancun. Continue to stay safe. Have a wonderful day, New Jersey. Go Devils. I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Thanks for listening once again.